Hello. Hi. I think we can uh, can get started. So I might just um, briefly um, introduce this morning's session while we wait for a few more people to, to or this afternoon session, sorry, as we wait for a few more people to join. So good afternoon. My name is Amanda Brissot. I'm the General Manager of the Western Sydney Business Connection, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, How to Gain an Unfair Competitive Advantage during a recession presented in partnership with our platinum partner, World Class Teams. Uh, before we commence, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are meeting on today, wherever that may be for you. I am on the land of the Darug people. The Darug people are the traditional owners of this land. I acknowledge the present Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who now reside within this area and elders past, present and emerging. Well, let's just jump straight into it. It is my pleasure to introduce Diana Tapp, uh, the CEO and founder of World Class Teams. Diana is an author, speaker, and internationally successful corporate educator, specialising in the development of high performance teams in business. She knows She's known for her practical and dynamic approach to learning and is passionate about delivering genuine change in an organisation. Diana believes that people are a business's best asset, especially in a recession. When teams are performing to their full potential, a business will not only survive, but thrive. Just before I hand over to Di, I'd like to talk to you briefly about WSBC membership. Um, a WSBC membership provides you with an excellent opportunity to build and strengthen your networks, uh, build your brand in Western Sydney and provide professional development opportunities for you and your team, such as uh, the webinar that we're hosting today. And if you're not already a WSBC member, please visit wsbc.org.au to find out which membership level best serves your business. Um, so without further ado, I will hand you over to Diana Tapp. Um, Diana will be making a presentation and we're really hoping for today to be very much a, 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 um, an interactive session. So please feel free to enter your questions uh, in the, and, and either through the question facility uh, or in the chat box within Zoom. Uh, and we will uh, aim to answer those throughout the session, but there will also be a, a time for Q&A at the end as well. So without further ado, let me hand you over to Di. Thank you so much, Amanda. And I'm actually going to stop sharing that PowerPoint just for now and come and see all of you easily. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I know that many of you are probably feeling almost zoomed out now. We've done so many zooms, haven't we, over the last sort of two and a half to three months. But for those of you who are a little bit new to it or to this number of people being on a Zoom call, smartest to just have your mic off for now um, and also to choose speaker view. You'll see up in the top right hand side, you can choose gallery or speaker view and it'd be smartest to use speaker at this at this time. And as Amanda said, if you put your questions in the Q&A box or also into the chat box and we'll stop during the presentation as well, just to receive those questions. Amanda's gonna keep a good handle on that for me. So thank you very much for doing that, Amanda. Welcome everybody, welcome. I'm so pleased that you've chosen to join the webinar today and what that tells me straight away is you're obviously ambitious about your business, that you are looking very much to say how do we stay ahead in the market um, and how do we not just survive but actually thrive during this time of, of recession. We know it's going to be tough and so that notion of how do I get myself an unfair, a competitive advantage so that we survive and not just survive but come through this recession thriving is something that we're, that we're chasing. And I know that's why you're here today. So that's my job to work on that with you. And I'm delighted to do so. Yes, we've seen the figures and we honestly already knew that we were going to be in a recession. And if you listen to the economists and the politicians, you'll see that they're talking about a decrease in GDP of anything up to 10%. Um, we know that already over half a million people have lost their jobs. We know that thousands of businesses have already gone under. So now becomes that notion of how do we make sure that we are on the good side of the stats, that we stay in business, um, not only survive, but in many cases that we actually manage to thrive during this time. That's not just in this recession time, it's not just that sales are going to be tougher. Um, we know that, we know that margins will be squeezed but it's also really hard for us as business leaders and as business owners because we really care about our people. And I know that for most of you, one of the heart-wrenching things is that fear that what if I had to lay off some of my people? That would really hurt because you know the impact that that would have on both those people and also on their families. So it's that notion of saying, you know, people are not just headcount, they're real people to me, they really matter. 
how do I ensure that we get the best out of our people, the best out of our business so that we can continue and come out the other side of this recession intact and potentially also thriving, not merely surviving. It is interesting to note that, of course, recessions are really tough, but that any time in history, at any and every time in history, businesses have been successful. And if you look at the stats that came out of the GFC, interestingly, some of the most valuable businesses that we have today were started in the GFC. Think Uber, think Airbnb, think WhatsApp, think Dropbox. So there are businesses that emerge, that thrive, and some of those are completely new businesses. And sometimes those are existing businesses who have managed to reinvent several times and stay in the game, stay up with the market and what people are wanting at that time. And I think that's the open secret of all of this, that in order to survive the recession, we need to be among the world's best at what we do. There is no good being above average. We need to be the best. We need to be able to look forward and look outwards so that we can see what else is there. We need to be very agile. We need to be confident about taking risks and making decisions and acting quickly. So when you look at the machine of business, it's really made up of two parts. You've got your systems and your processes, and then you've got your people, two distinct parts. And over the last 20 years, we've put an enormous focus on the systems and processes, making sure that we optimize those. We have reduced our wastage. We've got leaner and meaner in every sense. Our processes are so much more um, refined and efficient and effective than they used to be. We've got our machines running at an optimal level. We've probably, in all honesty, squeezed as much as we can out of that getting our processes and systems better and better there's not a whole lot left. So it's now not a way where we can become more competitive in the marketplace. And in fact, our competitors themselves quickly can catch up on systems and processes as well. So that now leaves us the other portion of that equation, our people side of the equation. And that's where I believe our competitive advantage now is, particularly to come out of this recession in a way where we are riding the top of the wave rather than being drowned by it. So let's focus on what we can do with our people. And it's actually not about squeezing more out of our people. It's about lifting our people, lifting the level that we're able to achieve with them. Because when you look at your people, they make a massive difference in your business already now. And that can be good or bad. If we think about those of our people who are dealing with customers, external customers, Every experience they have with a customer is either a good one or a bad one. If they do a great job with our customers, then you know those customers potentially become raving fans. They're definitely coming back to you. They're recommending business to you. If that level of service, though, is mediocre, it certainly doesn't need to be bad. If it's mediocre, then those customers start looking elsewhere. They start looking to your competitors. If you've got people who are going the extra mile, they make sure that they stay in until that project is done. They do it to the highest standard. They do it with their heart as well as their head. That's really beneficial to your business. Equally, if we've got some people in our business who are just going through the motions a bit, then that's going to be really detrimental to your business. We can't afford, in a recession, we can't afford to have those people who are just going through the motions. And worse than that, we know probably that in most of our businesses, we've got someone that we think, oh, wouldn't mind it if they did go elsewhere. We've got those people who are negative. And we like to kind of push them to one side and you know, pretend that they don't matter too much. But actually, all the research shows that they have a really negative impact on your team as a whole and on, therefore, the performance of your team. So we need to address there's a whole lot of continuous improvement we can do with our people. And we need to know how to do that and then to really start doing it. When we think about our people, we know uh, that they are our greatest asset. We're quick to say that, oh, yes, my people, they're my greatest asset. But interestingly, when I talk with managers and leaders and say, you know, what's the hardest part of business for you? There's almost no hesitation. They come back and say, oh, it's the people, you know, gosh, sometimes if only I didn't have that people, it would be easy. 
So we know that people are both our greatest asset, but are actually also our biggest headache. You know, as leaders and managers, we spend a huge amount of time covering up where they haven't done the best thing with customers, smoothing those waters again, dealing with the misunderstandings and the miscommunications, dealing with the conflicts between people in our team, trying to break down those silos between our sales and operational staff. So there's a whole raft of energy that goes into dealing with those headaches. And if you could imagine getting rid of those headaches and really being able to unleash all of that power of your people in a positive way, that's where you've got this massive list in, lift in improvement. And that's when we're going to see that ability to be able to ride this recession wave on top and come out thriving rather than just hanging on or perhaps even not surviving. So I'd like you to think about your people right now. They're actually like icebergs. So what you're getting from your people right now is that piece of the iceberg up above the surface. And if you think about an iceberg, you know that there's a small percentage above the surface and a massive percentage below the surface. All too often right now, we're only seeing that piece above the surface. There's an enormous amount, therefore, of potential and power sitting underneath that iceberg, our people icebergs. So key for us as leaders right now is to say, how on earth do I unleash that potential that's underneath the water? Because if I can get that, I'm going to be massively lift the, lift the performance of my people. And in turn, that, of course, lifts the performance of our business. Gallup research over, gosh, more than 10 years now has shown that, sadly, with all of our talk and effort in engaging people, actually only about 30% of our people are really giving their best effort. So while we haven't got much room to move at all in our systems and processes anymore, we've got massive space with our people to really lift them to be able to get that 70% and more that's sitting underneath the surface and rising that to the top. Imagine the difference that that would make to your business. So for over 20 years now, we've been working with and helping leaders and managers in their business to work on their people iceberg, how to unleash that potential that lies beneath the surface. And we've worked with a whole range of companies, um, Red Kite, Lion, um, Cathay Pacific, Hawkesbury City Council, um, a number of WSBC members, the NAB, CIB accountants, Hicks Group, and so on. And that's let us really see what works and what doesn't work with this people iceberg. And in fact, it's let us decipher seven steps to helping your people to become world-class. And I'm gonna share those seven steps with you today. Get those seven steps right, and you will certainly come out of this recession in perhaps even better shape than you went into it. In order for us to do that though, we firstly need to go, all right, there's seven steps to become world-class, but where do your people actually sit right now? So we're firstly going to do a little bit of analysis. I'm going to share the PowerPoint with you. And while I'm moving that across, please get yourself a pen and paper ready because we, you're going to start to do this analysis with me right now on the webinar. So I'll share that with you now. This is what we're looking to do to unlock that people power of your people. And so on your piece of paper, we're going to do what we call the performance quadrant. And as the name suggests, there are going to be four squares and you are going to put your people into those squares. Now, if you've got a large team, just utilize the people who are direct reports to yourself right now, use that smaller team. If you are in an organization up to say 20 people, then absolutely you can look to do this activity with all of the 20 people in your organization. So I want you firstly, please, to draw up your vertical axis. And that's going from can't do, not highly skilled, up to can do, very highly skilled. And then across the top horizontal axis, have to through to want to. So this is your motivational axis. Obviously, the people who are highly motivated, they're in the want to category. And those who, oh, they just do what they have to do, they're sitting at the left-hand end of that axis. And then if you build yourself four quadrants, four rectangles, 
coming out underneath that. And I want you now to think of the people in your team, please, quite specifically. Um, so up to, the, up to the 20 people if you're a smaller organisation or the people who report directly through you. Because the first group of people that we're going to be thinking about are your high flyers. If you think about the axes here, these are your people who are highly skilled, they can do a whole lot of things in your business, and they're highly motivated. So they're in the top right. Secondly, I want you to think about the graduates who you've got in your team. These people are also highly motivated. They will go the extra mile for you. They don't yet have all the skills that they need. They've still got some learning to do in terms of what we do in our business for them to be the most valuable that they could be. But they're certainly on their way. And training is all that's required to get them into that top box with the other high flyers. Then you've got a box over on the left hand, top left. So these are your people who can do a whole lot. They've probably been in your business for a long time. They're highly qualified, they're highly skilled. The problem is, look up onto that motivational axis, they're kind of going through the motions. They do things because they have to. Oh, well, you know what, it's just what we've got to do. That, oh yeah, it's just part of my job. They're not jumping out of their skin to go for it. They're feeling like, well, I, I do what needs to be done. Some of these coasters actually used to be high flyers. They've kind of lost their mojo, some of them. And so they're now sitting in that top left. You can imagine in that iceberg model, they've got a whole lot sitting underneath the surface that you're not getting the benefit of right now. And then fourthly, we've got that group at the bottom that we call the prisoners. So as you can see from where they sit, the prisoners can't do a whole lot and they don't want to do a whole lot either. They do the bare minimum to get by. And in fact, if they were to leave, you would probably be quietly happy that they did so. So I'm going to be quiet now and I'm going to give you four minutes to think about your own team and to, and you need to physically do this please. So it's harder than it sounds. I want you to allocate each of the people in your team to one of those boxes. Are they in the high flyers box? Did they used to be, but they're now coasters, graduates or prisoners? Each person sitting in one of those boxes. So I'll keep quiet while you do that now.
Great. So we're going to call that three or four minutes. I'm sure that you've started and perhaps even found that it was a little bit more difficult than you thought to decide which box some of your people would sit in. Some are perhaps easy. I'd encourage you over the next week to make sure that you revisit that quadrant, that you continue to put your people in space and to think about where they go. And in fact, I would recommend that you do this with your leadership team. Um, because as a team, sometimes what we realize is we want people to be in a certain box, but they actually fit in a different one. So being honest in this space enables us to see what does our current iceberg look like, people iceberg look like, where do we need to go next? I'm going to give you a few, a few stats here that will help you to see where average companies sit. So in an average company, there's about 13% of your business, people in your business will be in that high flyer category. Oh, I can't see him behind there. Yep. And the 74% is sitting split between the coasters and the graduates. So you can see you've got a huge number of people sitting there with potential that we're not currently utilizing well. We need to look after our high flyers to make sure they don't go anywhere else because we certainly don't want to lose them. But we need to lift the graduates and the coasters so that we can move that 74%, we can move some of them up into that high fly category. And if you think about moving just 30% of them, that's going to give you a significant increase in the level of performance for them, for their teams, and also for your business. And then sadly, in average companies, there's about 13% of our people who are prisoners. Unfortunately, when you think about who we spend most of our time on in a business, it's often those prisoners, isn't it? <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of the things that I want us to focus on today, that's for a whole nother day, but one of the things to focus on today is there's 74%, the coasters and the graduates. These seven steps in particular that I'm going to share with you now, they're designed to lift those coasters and graduates so that you've got more high flyers, so that you get higher levels of performance and you're better able to weigh, ride this recession wave, come out with it on top. Now, I'm sure that you probably have some questions already. So I'm going to check in with you, Amanda, and see, have we got some questions there coming through from the group, please? Um, no, there aren't any questions just yet, Di, so I think you could probably oh, go on, but let us know, please, yeah, as, as we said, please enter into the Q&A um, <clears throat> box at the bottom of your screen or the, uh, the chat box. But we have one. What if they are all high flyers? <laughs> I wish. Then be absolutely looking after them because if they are all high flyers, you are sitting in a prime position um, to be able to ride out this recession really well. It also means that every other company in your industry is going to be looking at your people. So it, take nothing for granted. Um, I say that sincerely. Absolutely, if you've got a team of high flyers, you are in a brilliant position. And that means that's not luck as well. That means you've got a strong culture and an excellent leadership going on as well. It does also mean that your vulnerability is you don't want those high flyers going anywhere else. So ensure that you keep a check on them, particularly in that motivation space. Mm -hmm. You know, what would they like to do next? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean a different position, but you need to keep them really highly engaged. Keep challenging them in projects and things that you've got inside the business. Keep them looking now for research to see what do we need to do in the marketplace so that they stay highly engaged. But well done, whoever you are, because it means you're doing a lot of things right already. Cool. So, uh, Deb, Debbie, Debbie says, good point, Diana, I need to buy them more coffee. But I think that's, I mean, that's a great point, rewarding, rewarding, you know, through obviously uh, salary is, is, is one thing, but if you can't afford salary, what are the, uh, what are some of the other um, ways you can, <clears throat> excuse me, reward your staff to? Absolutely, absolutely. And there's a wonderful saying that says, we go where we are wanted, we stay where we're appreciated. Too often, we don't do exactly those small things, the buying the coffee, the sending the nice card, the saying to taking the time to say to someone, thank you, I really appreciate what you did there. Um, we sometimes overestimate the importance of dollars and underestimate the importance of those small acts of appreciation that really make the difference to people. Time and time again, we see that being key and, and hanging on to people. They need to feel absolutely appreciated in that, in that space. Good point, Amanda, and thank you, Debbie, as well. Well, let's look at going into these seven steps then, because that's the next part and the part that you probably all want to see. What are these seven steps? How do I? How do you get a world-class um, team, a 
performance that's world class in your business from all of the people there, certainly moving that curve up. So as I mentioned to you, there are seven steps and they're really clear as we go as we go through each of these. So let's look at them in turn. And again, um, I'll stop at the end of the section of seven steps. So if you've got questions, pop them into the Q&A box there so that Amanda can keep um, tabs on that for us as well. Step number one, the first thing you need to do is ensure that your team is really fired up. We see this in sport, you know, we see teams coming together before they play and you probably have detected a little accent on me that comes from the islands to the east of us. Um, so you know that the All Blacks do the haka at the beginning of every game. In fact, every New Zealand sports team, uh, representative team, has a haka that they do. That helps the team to be fired up. They know what the goal is and they know that this is their way of getting ready for all of that. So it's about having a team vision. It's about having a team vision though that is really punchy and really inspiring. If it's a bland, all-encompassing motherhood statement, that's not firing up your team. So many of us, particularly in larger organizations, you've got a, a vision statement or a mission statement that's perhaps sitting on your website or beautifully framed in your reception area. And if I came in and asked you what it was, you'd probably look a little bit embarrassed and go, um, not really sure. If we're not really sure, that means it's not serving the purpose that it's supposed to. So we need it to be short, we need it to be punchy. In many organisations, the organisation itself has got a mission or a vision statement that many of the teams don't find particularly inspiring. They have written and created their own, and that's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Each of the teams in your business, you want them to have a vision, a vision that is created by them, not for them, and is really punchy and is really inspiring for them. Because right now, we've got so much uncertainty with COVID, so much uncertainty in this, recession, in this recession time. We need people to be hungry. We need them to be really focused on what it is that we're looking to achieve. And that's what your vision will do. It lets us say, this is the course, this is the track that we're on. If you don't do that, then people will make up their own agendas. They'll have their own course that they're running on and that can become really divisive for your team rather than convergent and really collaborative and lifting them up. Not necessarily at all that there's any conflict, but just we've got people scattering rather than us all absolutely being on the same bus and going to the same destination and really wanting to do that. So there's a series of questions to ask, but I've selected a couple of them for you just to think about today. I mean, the first one is, does your team have a team vision? If not, create one. Ensure though that that team vision is punchy and inspiring. Both their heads and their hearts need to be in the game of this. So it's critical that you have both of those in that space now more than ever. Step two, game-changing conversations or communication. I like to think of conversations as being the oil in the machine of business. So if you think about what happens, that machine runs really well when there's high quality oil and there's enough oil there. In other words, if our communication is frequent enough and it's of high quality, the machine of our business runs really well. If that oil is poorer quality, if our conversations, our communication is not such a high standard, then the machine doesn't run as well. If there's insufficient oil, if there's insufficient communication going on, the machine doesn't run as well. And in the worst instance, I guess, there's that gritty oil, that ineffective communication that can actually cause the machine to break down. So we need to get really good at ensuring that our communication is using the right channel, that it's clear, that we do it frequently enough um, so that our business, our machine and our business is fair humming along. Again, a couple of questions for us to be looking at in this space. What I see time and time again when I ask not the leaders, but the people in the organisation about what's difficult in communication, they go, yeah, like, I don't want to put my hand up. I'm afraid to speak up and say what I really think. Let me tell you, this is in spite of so many leaders saying, oh, but we really encourage them. We really encourage them to speak up. What can you do? My question is, or statement is, look in the mirror. 
because so often if your people are afraid to speak up, it may be that you say, just tell us what you think. But when they do, how do you respond? Do they get them? <sighs> look, yeah, look, if you'd had more experience, because the minute you say that, of course that person's not going to speak up again. Or if you go, oh, yes, but we wouldn't be able to do that because that doesn't encourage a person to speak up the next time. On top of that, be mindful that sometimes people are afraid to speak up, not because of what happens with your team, but because what happened to them in a previous organisation or with a previous team, where they got hammered when they spoke up once before. So they're not that likely to put their hand up again. So we need to really build an environment where we truly mean that we want people to speak up. And I think that's going to be more critical now in a recession because we need people to come up with different ideas. We need people to say when they're feeling a bit apprehensive. We need them to say straight away when they've noticed a change with our customers, not wait and hope that it goes away. That's so detrimental at any time. It's really detrimental now during a recession. Is feedback happening? Is it effective and is it immediate? You know, again, we need our feedback in real time, both the positive and the constructive. And yes, there's a whole lot about how we should deliver that feedback to ensure that we don't get the blame game, that we don't get issues happening. It's really critical right now that that feedback is immediate because we've got to be able to change. We've got to be able to move rapidly in this time of recession. And if we don't have that feedback, we don't have enough data. We don't have enough facts to be able to say, this is where we should turn. This is where we should go next. Sorry, Jai, before we get too far into the seven steps, we do have a question um, from Alex Boyce. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Do you have an example of a good team vision that you could share? Ooh. Yes, I do. We, um, I worked recently with a, with a mining company, or a mining company, but a team within that, and they were in operations. And one of the things that they knew they struggled with in terms of their reputation in the organisation was that they were seen as the, oh, the blockers. We won't be able to do that. We won't be able to do that. So they, and we did this over the course of a half day together. So it's intense, uh, but it's fun. And there's a good adrenaline, adrenaline rush. They came out with, we ask we listen, we deliver. And they put full stops in between it and they practiced it so that it just came off their tongues. Um, that's mm -hmm. on all of their signatures. They all know what it is and it means anything that comes up, the manager's like, hang on, what do we do? We ask, oh gee. So that notion of, oh, sorry, we can't, that can't appear anymore. We ask, we listen, we deliver has become their, their mantra, if you like. So it's been really useful in that space. Um, we use in our, in our business, we have, we deliver change, not just training. So our whole mantra is, if you don't get change with us, we haven't delivered on our vision. Um, it's not training, it's not ticking the box, it's making sure that there's delivery out the other end there. And I guess it depends on how big your, um, your organisation is. I mean, we are quite a small organisation at WSBC, so our our mission for the organisation actually also doubles as our as our team mission. But I imagine that once you've you've broken down into into teams or into silos, as a lot of the big organisations are, and you're responsible for for delivering certain parts of the of the business, not not a sort of more holistic um, approach as as you do with a smaller organisation, that you just need to start breaking down what it is your team is responsible for. Um, and what what mission statement you would you attach to, to to that outcome? Absolutely, and it's so powerful when the team creates this, right? So what we don't want is a vision that's delivered to the team. Um, and to this day, I've, I've often hear leaders say, "Oh, I'm working on our vision." Die. You will work on it with your team, you know, because it's to fire up not just you; it's to fire up your team as well. So critical that you do that. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about the end. We do have a process that we we go in and we do with teams. It, it requires them to do prep. It's a massive adrenaline rush and there has moments where it's very exciting and moments where it's very messy, but out will pop a vision that you go, yes, and you know you've got it when everyone goes, yes, and their eyes sparkle. That, that's when it's got both the head and the heart. While we're going, oh yeah, this looks pretty good. We haven't got it at that point. So um, it, is, it is a process. Happy to talk to you, Alex, about that as well. If you like, it's a really good question. Really and it's a good filter. I mean, just just to I guess put put my own experience uh, onto this. It's a good filter by which to assess 
any decision or anything that you do or any you can kind of you know like our, our mission WSBC's mission is to is to connect is connecting for growth and everything we do the decisions that we make about what um what what steps we're going to take we, we overlay that are, are we are we connecting for growth does this connect for growth do, do, in, and it needs to it need you need to answer yes to that for it to sort of remain a priority for the for the team i suppose um, so it's a it's a great it's a great tool once you've once you've nailed it it's a total decision making tool right so we use it in the same way if this is not going to if we don't believe sometimes we'll get asked by a company to come and do a half day workshop that's going to give them magnificent leaders we won't get the change in a half day workshop so it's called we can't say yes to that it's as simple as that. So it is, it's a brilliant decision-making tool. What are the right decisions to make? They need to be led by your, by your vision in that space. Absolutely. Great. We do have another question um, here, which I think is a great, is, which is a great question. Um, at the end of the day, employees will never care as much as the owner, um, as it's their business, their blood, their sweat, their tears, and they have so much more invested in it. So what's... What's, um, what are your thoughts on giving employees a stack in the outcome or to make them the owners? Oh, cool. Can I park that for now? We're going to do a little, we can imagine that that's one of the steps and then remind me, Amanda, we'll come back to that as well because I think we'll partially cover it as we go through the steps, but we'll come back to that too. Great question. Um, it is true. There will never be the same passion, but my goodness, we can get a high level. If you think about high flyers, there's a high level of ownership and accountability in those people too. Yeah. Um, you'll see the last question on on the game changing communication is that notion about are you able to have the honest conversations again right now in recession times we're going to need to be able to pivot we need to be able to listen to our people we need to have honest conversations ourselves if people are not up to the mark we've got to be able to address that straight away so that we can be back on that bus and having it going at full throttle third step Optimise your time. You know, until COVID, when we started saying, how are you again? And it meant about health. We've had for some years now, how are you? And we all go busy, so busy. So we know that we are in this space where there's so much to do and we just never have enough time to do it all. That so often at the end of the day, we feel like, oh my gosh, I haven't even stopped and I've achieved absolutely nothing. Which is usually a euphemism for, I've done a whole lot of things on other people's lists but not the things that I know are most important for my role. So right now we need to make sure that we talk about working smarter, not harder. I think most of the time we work smarter, we hope, and certainly harder. So we need to get and say, where's the big bang for the buck? What are the things that we really need to focus on in our team right now that's really going to make a difference to our business? What are those links with our customers? What are those links that we've got that say, where's that 80-20 rule? You know, the 20% of things that we do that give us 80% of our results. That pressure, when we feel it otherwise, it takes its toll on us. You know, we tend to make mistakes when we're under too much pressure. We go home late. We lie in bed thinking, oh, gosh, I've got all these things that I didn't do today that I now need to do tomorrow. So that damages that motivational level as well. We need people to feel that they're being very productive, that they are focused on the right things, and that, that most times we go home or go out of the office thinking, yes, I'm happy with what I've achieved today. So there's a series of techniques in there, but some of them relate to these two probably banes of our lives in that optimizing our time space. You know, do emails and meetings fill up your day? We need some of them, absolutely. But if that's all that you do all day, you probably feel pretty frustrated and pretty frustrated with yourself and pretty frustrated with some of those emails and some of those meetings that are there. Do you feel busy all day, but you know, just feel like I've got nothing done? We need to change that paradigm. That's one of the key reasons when people don't feel productive as high flyers, that's when they start moving back into that coaster's box. They need to feel like they're achieving, like they're getting done what really matters for the business. And that means for us as a leader, being very articulate about what are the priorities. It goes back to that vision to an extent. And then what are the priorities that we've got? Under the uncertain times we've had in COVID, those priorities had to narrow too, haven't they, in terms of their timeframes. We don't know what's going to happen in two and three years. We don't even know what's going to happen in three months. We do know what to focus on in the next couple of weeks. So as a leader, you massively can help your people to get that sense that they are achieving really significantly during their working days. Step four, leaders who truly lead. 
and truly is the word to emphasize here. Sometimes people are in leadership roles and you know what? They're busily playing the blame game. Oh, we didn't get that done. Oh, we had to rely on this. Leaders who lead have got two really important parts, authority and empathy. And prior to COVID, I certainly would have said, we have as a leader, we will have a tendency to be better at one of those than the other. If we've got greater authority, we're really good at making decisions. We're good at dealing with a few facts and making a decision and getting on with it, um, creating certainty for our people. If we're good at empathy, we're good at showing our people that we really do care. Now, now leaders need to step up because now we need both of those in equal measure. Both authority, making decisions, creating certainty, and a care about our people like we've never needed before. So it's really critical that your leaders bump up and really step up. They are key. So no matter how large or small your organization is, your leaders, and by that I mean your leaders, your managers, your team leaders, your supervisors, anyone who's responsible for a team of people, all of these people need to be really at their best level so that they can impact obviously their entire teams. All great teams have great leaders. You see it on the sports field. Exactly the same thing happens in business. There is not a great team who doesn't have a great leader. Okay? So we really need to be focused on them. And actually that means us looking in the mirror sometimes too. Sometimes we excuse ourselves for the aspects of our leadership that we're not so good at. Get rid of the excuses. You know, we need to have no gaps, especially if you're in the executive leadership team. And I don't mean that that means you suddenly become God, but it says those times when we say, well, I'm not that great at this, but I'm really good at this. We need to stop the awe and say, I'm not that good at this. I need to get a whole lot better at it because in order for us to come out of this recession well, our leaders really have to step up and be at that 95%, not the 80% that we could actually manage quite easily pre-COVID. Do your managers bring out the best in their teams? That's what our job is. You know, we, our job as a leader and a manager is to walk with, have our people walking with us, not to be out the front in that old school day and sort of dragging them along, but to have them wanting to walk beside you. That means you've got to bring out the best in your people. Look at that iceberg. You know, how are you making sure that you're utilizing their strengths and really utilizing them? To delegate effectively and stop that micromanaging. I think delegation is probably one of the poorest um, elements that leaders have done in the past. And it's so critical now. We don't have enough, go back to optimize your time. We don't have enough time to do everything. We need to make sure then that we delegate well and that we don't micromanage because micromanaging really annoys those high flyers in particular. Going the extra mile. So this links back to the question that was asked um, in the chat just a moment ago about you know how do you get that sense of ownership? Build these steps, but particularly build step five. We need our people to go the extra mile. We know that those people in our team who are highly motivated, they are like gold. Hang on to them. Because if you've got people motivated, that means that they want to rather than they have to. So they really look after your customers, not because they have to and it's expected as part of their role, but because they really want to. They really care about doing the best for their customers. There's a problem. They really care about fixing it. They're highly motivated. They're going to use their initiative. They're going to look to solve that problem rather than pass the problem to someone else and give it to them to fix. So we need to find, and there are great tools that we have, there are, we, you need to find those buttons. What are those buttons to push with each person in your team that motivate them, that keep them motivated so that they'll go the extra mile. And incidentally, the buttons that you push are the same buttons that they'll push. So when you learn what those buttons are, I want you to learn not just what they are for your benefit, but also make sure that the people know themselves. What are my hot buttons? What do I need to do if I'm feeling a bit flat? so that I can really get myself back into that highly motivated box because when we're highly motivated, our work is of the best quality, we're as productive as possible, up we go in terms of team performance and therefore in terms of business performance. It's short and sharp, but it is such a key aspect that we need, such a key aspect in terms of becoming world-class. 
are you worried that your best people might turn up? Because you know what happens when we don't have this notion of how to motivate each person in our team, what we tend to do is give more work to the people who are highly motivated. So we've got our busy people. We, we say, give it to a busy person. That busyness, we should probably not call busyness. We should say highly motivated because that's what happens. There are people who say yes. There are people who get things done. And so we tend to give more and more to them. That's a problem if we end up with this real imbalance of workload so that our best people are doing so much extra work that they run the risk of being burnt out. And we saw that happening in COVID, didn't we? Particularly when people were working from home, that it was harder, much harder to get that boundary between work life and personal life. And that there was this sort of seepage or oozing of one into the other. For a time, that's fine. But over the long term, that's when we start to get burnout. And we know that that burnout is going to be even worse during recession times now because there's already that additional pressure that people are feeling in terms of their mental health and well-being that's happened as a result of COVID. So this becomes knowing which buttons to press and making sure that we really look after our people so that they will deliver the best, so that they will see the business as their own. Yep truthfully not quite as much as we will as business owners but definitely you can get to them to that 95 percent of that so i guess one of the um one of the, the 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 big things about a recession is often businesses have to do more or at the very least the same with less resources so you know you talk about this idea of of, of burnout um, when you still have the same amount of, of output that's required but you now have less resources do you have any advice around managing that from a leadership perspective? Yeah, I think massively goes back to that iceberg, Amanda. You know, we've got this number of people, but we've got all of this potential underneath. Um, where is most of that sitting? Most of it is sitting with our graduates and our coasters. So upskilling our graduates. And sometimes we don't upskill people because we don't feel that we've got time. If you don't spend the time upskilling, they'll stay down here. So we've got all this untapped potential that we could be utilizing. Similarly with our coasters, which is why that quadrant model is so important because it lets us target the right things for the right people. For our coasters, it's not about upskilling. For our coasters, it's about that go the extra mile. What are the right buttons to hit? And we have a tool that enables you to find that out. Moving them so that they go from being just going through the motions to absolutely flying for you. There's so much there that we're not using. So we don't need to squeeze, we need to lift. And I think currently we've got, oh, we've got to squeeze more out of our people. Because uh -uh. if you do, you're squeezing your high flyers, your best people. We need to lift that 74%. Remember, that's a huge number. Three quarters of your people can be lifted. We can get so much more out of them when we go through these seven steps and do it in the right way with each of our people. Step six, accelerate your EQ. It's so interesting, isn't it, how much we talk about emotional intelligence, EQ now. And what we've in fact found is that if you look at someone's EQ, that is a much stronger predictor of their success than their IQ. And probably all of us know some highly intelligent people who just don't get it, we'll say. Their EQ is lagging their IQ. One of the great things about EQ is that you can learn it, one of the super critical things during recession is you need to learn it. You need to have a really high EQ now because this is all about how well do you manage your emotions. And most of us can manage our emotions pretty well when things are going well. The challenge becomes when things are really tough, that's when we can lose it. That's when it's harder to manage our emotions. So right now, there's lots of reasons that we might lose it. We need to make sure that we find ways to manage our emotions well so that we can still get outcomes. And also that we can respond appropriately to other people's emotions. You know, your customers, your staff are also under greater pressure than they've ever been. So sometimes fuses are a bit short. As a leader, we need to manage both our own emotions and dare I say it, we also need to manage other people's emotions as well. Still get to that outcome, make sure that we can stay calm listen, acknowledge, and drive ourselves to an outcome. So critical in there, how good are your people? The good thing is, as I say, we can learn this. So you can learn how to be better at emotional intelligence. And it's critical that we are. We can't go back into that excuse that we've often, oh, well, she yelled at me, so I yelled at her. That's not high emotional intelligence. 
you know, her voice got louder, so my voice got louder. That's not emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. How well do we perform under pressure? Because those are the telling times. Being great when things are going along well, that is good, but that's not what people notice. They notice how good are you when you're really under pressure? How good are you when things are not going well? That's what emotional intelligence enables you to do, that you're really good at performing, including under pressure. Paramedics, fireys are good examples of people with high EQ. No matter the pressure, they manage all sorts of emotions and abuse that's coming their way. In business, we hope we don't have that level of abuse, but certainly we'll see emotion coming our way, which is uncomfortable, and we need to learn how to deal with that well. Does the frustration in your team show, and that last little part, does yours sometimes too. Most of us don't have a poker face. So we need to know, we need to have ways that we can get our emotions back in check so that we then can continue on to get the outcomes that we want with people. And again, there are some little tools and some little tricks that you can do in order to get that. Then the last step, the last step that is so important in terms of becoming world-class and is so critical right now, I believe in the recession. And that is about building your change muscle. You know, in the past, we traditionally haven't been that great at change. We've, we've even used phrases like, oh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We have learned, and our company, boy, above, not, I'm going to say above all others, that's not true at all. But we have done a massive reinvent during, during COVID-19. Pre-COVID-19, we were completely a face-to-face -face training company. Now we are, obviously, we would be out of business if that's all we did now. So we've added the virtual suite to ourselves. That reinvention has been, yes, sometimes exhausting and also very exciting. And I'm really proud of where we sit now. We've added to our suite. That ability to pivot and change is so critical. And we've talked about the new normal as if there is only one. There's not a new normal or the new normal, there's a whole string of new normals that we're going to go through. And the businesses that are going to survive and thrive will be the businesses that can keep changing and adapting to each one of those new normals. So build your change muscle. Again, as a leader, that starts with you. We need to make sure that we enjoy change rather than just endure change. We need to make sure that we are prepared to act quickly when you won't have all the facts. We need to deal with ambiguity like we've never needed to before. We need to help our people. That means as well making mistakes. We'll change some things and they won't work. Good, fail fast and figure out what you're going to do next. But that means encouraging people to try, knowing that we won't always succeed. And if we look in the mirror as leaders, we often find that we're really good at saying it's okay to make mistakes, but we don't like making them ourselves. We're going to need to make some ourselves too. Fail fast. What did you learn from it? What are we going to do next? And use your team to help you on that journey as well. So our questions in that building your change muscle are, are you seen as a change agent? Not do you implement change. A change agent is up there holding the flag. They thrive on change. They like it. As leaders, that's where you need to be and you need to build. As some of your people will also be change agents, you need them to the forefront and build more change agents in your business. One of the easiest ways to know that is to say, what questions do you ask? Do you ask, can we do that? Should we do that? Which is easy to say, yes, no, yes, no. What about the question that changes just slightly and becomes, how can we? How can we do this? How can we try that? What if we did this differently? Those are the questions of a change agent and those are the questions we need to foster. They're not questions we've used all that much traditionally. And thirdly, ooh, do you have some of those serious resistors in your team? Because we need to overcome that resistance with them. And again, that's not by just hoping and sidelining them. That's actually by dealing with the resistance, finding a way through that with your people so that they will get on board your bus. Because all of those people we've got, to go back to your point, Amanda, all of those people that we've got on the bus, we've got to be lifting them. We've got to get the maximum that we can out of them so that we're not squeezing people we're lifting them and getting ourselves ready to come through that recession. So those are the seven steps. I'm gonna come back and face to face with all of you now. Let me just stop that because I'm picking, there might be a few more questions. Would I be right?
We don't have any um, questions in the Q&A box at the moment, but I just did want to um, go back to this, this question that Emil um, had, had asked around giving them a stack in, in, in the outcome. Um, I guess, you know, that there's, there's something that we all want as individuals and that is to feel fulfilled in our, in our jobs and in our work. And, you know, we can't all be, you know, working in, in Africa saving, saving children. So sometimes, that, you know, many of us do have jobs that might be a little at times um, mundane. How, how can we encourage um, or how can we promote um, sort of fulfilment in, 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 in people's roles, I guess? I mean, I think, you know, that's whilst they don't own the business and, you know, they don't, they don't have the same investment in the business as perhaps the owner does, I would say, you know, in, ensuring that, that your workforce feels fulfilled is probably a great, a great way to, to keep them engaged. What, what advice do you have in that space? I'd say two of those steps are really important. The first one, step one, make sure that you've got a team vision. People want to have a purpose. Um, so there's a story about the stonemasons that some of you may have heard where there were three stonemasons side by side and a, a reporter went up to them and said, oh, what are you doing? And the first one said, oh, mate, you know, I'm chipping out these stones. This is what I do eight hours a day and I come back tomorrow and I do it again. He oh. goes to the second guy and says, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm making bricks out of this sandstone. You know, I, I make X number of bricks every day. And he goes to the third person and says, what are you doing, mate? He said, I'm building a cathedral. The person who can see that vision, who knows this is what I'm here for, where there's a purpose, guess who was more motivated out of those three? No, it's a, it's a no-brainer. So that vision is really important. And the second part is that, you know, engage with your people. Make sure that you you know what buttons to push. So Emil, if you send me your email address, I'll share with you a tool that we have that lets you find out what buttons do you need to push? It isn't necessarily the money. I think that's what we always assume. Oh, let's give them a bonus or let's give them a percentage of the business. That will definitely work for some people, absolutely. But for many, that's not what the driver is. So sometimes we're offering things that they don't really care about. And we say, oh, they don't care as much as me because we're pushing the wrong buttons. We're pushing our buttons rather than finding out what their buttons are and pushing their buttons. So flick me a note. Emil, happy to share that tool with you as well. I'm sure if anybody else is interested in that tool, just let, let us know. Um, one more question here from Ed. Any ideas for micro business leaders to be well prepared for when they have a team? So I guess that's we're talking about sort of startup. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, whoever that person is, flick me a little text and I'll have a discussion with you because there are more questions that I'd like to ask you before I can answer that one. Your vision is of where you're going um, and who will do what roles, but you're in a great position because you've got the bus and now it's about who are we going to put on the bus. So there's a really, there's a really good discussion to have around that. Absolutely. There's another question here. Um, the 13% prisoners, what do we do with them? Clear them out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, like that, that's the hard reality, right? We spend so much time and energy on them. You know, if you think about your coasters and your graduates, you've only got one axis to fix and they're sitting in that high flies box. In our prisoner box, we've not only got to upskill them, but we've got to get them motivated. I'm not going to say it never happens. I've seen it happen and it's so exciting when it does. But honestly, if we are sitting in a situation where we don't have enough time, we don't have enough time and energy for everything, that's exactly where we shouldn't be spending our time and energy. We should be absolutely moving it, spending it with the 74% that we can move. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're going to be losing people, yes, those are the people that you want to lose. And I guess in the long term, it says to us, let's be very careful about who we hire. You know, sometimes we could see this when we hired people and they were, oh, well, we didn't really have anyone suitable. They were the best that was available. Time and time again, we find that that is not a good strategy. You, know, you want to have the right people on the bus right from the start and that's difficult to do it's why we have things like probation yeah, but yeah you don't want them <laughs> they're not, there and they're certainly not going to do you a service right now absolutely there, not. there is obviously a whole lot of rules and regulations around that so make sure you do your research oh, before you yeah, absolutely. do that and, and i can talk to you about <laughs> how to lift your people i'm not going to say that my space is is ir in that space so happy to talk about what you want to do with the 74 and the 13 happy to talk some issues on the 13 but yeah if you're going to go down that pathway um of course make sure that you that you do it well but honestly 
the minute that you let them go, you usually go, oh my gosh, why did I not do that before? That certainly was my experience when I've done it as well. Like, why did you wait? Why did you wait for so long to do this? And WFBC does have a, 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 a number of members that can assist you in that space. So if you do need some advice, please let us know and we can direct you to, to some experts that can assist you with that. Um, probably time for one last question. We are just about to go over uh, time. Um, what are some successful ways to deliver change to the team and make it stick? Oh, fantastic. Um, that person needs to send me, because I've got one more thing that we want to do before we finish up today. Send me through, um, again, just put change and send me through send me through a text. I'm going to give you those details at the end, because absolutely, we have a model that we use called DSPY, and that helps change to be successful. Um, for this person, you've probably seen that 70% of change programs actually fail. So we want to be in the 30% that succeed, and the DSPY model really helps you to do that. And it's very specific in the four areas that it has. So happy to share that with you too. Okay. I'm just going to go back and share my screen with you because there's a part here that leaders have been asking me at the moment, and I think it's probably from these good questions coming through, sitting in your minds about where do, we, where do we start? So you have started now, right? You've started that analysis of your people by complete that quadrant. Make sure that you put each of your people in those four quadrants. If you've got multiple teams, share that with your other team so that they do the same thing. You've seen the seven steps that you need in order to become world-class. And of course, you now need to go and fill out each of those steps and say, where do my people sit on each of these? Where are the gaps that we have in the seven steps and how are we going to fill them? And you can do that yourself or you can fast track that by doing that with us. Um, many leaders at the moment are going, oh, this all makes sense to me, Di, but you know, I can't do all seven steps right now. So like, where do we go? Where do I start? And I do have a recommendation of two steps that absolutely I would start on right now. And that first step, you probably won't be surprised from some of your questions and what I've said today is step one. You know, get that vision right with your team. Um, make sure that they do know that they are fired up, that they do know what the game plan is in a way that's inspiring for them, okay? It needs to be punchy. We do that with companies. It's a half day that we work with your team. They do some prep beforehand. Otherwise, you can imagine it couldn't happen. It does not take three months. It takes half a day. And I can promise you, you'll come out with that one sentence, punchy, memorable, inspiring vision. If you don't have that, you haven't got step one ticked off. Okay? The second step that absolutely I would do right now, because it's the biggest bang for your buck, is make sure you've got leaders who truly care, who truly lead, because you can imagine each of your leaders is in the course all of their team. So that's a really good way to go get them right and you already get that flow on effect. Let's say we've got four leaders um, lifted, then those four leaders plus all of their team. So potentially four people get lifted will impact 35 people in your business. So 100% I would be going down that pathway if you're sitting in a situation where you go, can't do all, but I can do some. Uh, and again, we can help you with those leaders. There's two ways that we can do that with you. One is to come into your business and design up a customized leadership program for your leaders in your team and deliver that in-house. Uh, what we also have right now is the Diploma of Leadership and Management. Um, it's a national qualification. And this can be a really great way if you've got two to four key leaders in your business who you really want to upskill and lift, you want to the benefit of that iceberg of them, this can be a fantastic way for them to gain that. Um, right now, in our partnership with WSBC, there is a really great opportunity going. So the full price of that program is 7590 per person. Um, right now, we are fortunate enough in New South Wales to have some government funding, which takes $4,740 off the price. So if you're a member of WSBC, it comes down to just 2850 pretty great investment to be able to get that level of lift. And the program that's coming up now starts on the 23rd of July. So if you are keen for some of your leaders to join that, um, get in touch with me. I'll put my details up here now actually for you. Um, so you'll see my mobile number there, 0417 or Diana Tapp at World Class Teams. Um, if you want to fast track in, flick through your details to me on the, on the text. If you just send me your email address right now, 
that no, that means I know you're interested in having further discussions. It doesn't, of course, commit you to anything at all, but it lets lets me know that you're interested in potentially step one and or step four. Um, and I think there's such a good reminder in this recession time that if we don't move quickly, we'll get left behind. So for those who know that life is about taking action, if you send that text through to me today, then there'll be two bonus things coming your way. One is as you can see on the screen now, the seven steps to becoming world class. So that's a PDF copy, which has more of the questions of the seven steps we've just talked about today. And secondly, Amanda mentioned at the start that I also have written a book. Um, so it's called Unleash Your Team's Potential, not surprisingly, getting to that iceberg of, of your people underneath. How to get the best out of the people you've already got. Because we don't usually have the luxury of getting more people, we need to get the best out of the people we've got. It's a practical read. I used to say read it on the plane, it's only this thick. Um, can't say read it on the plane quite so much now, but definitely it's a, it's a good read for those of you who are looking for some really practical tips again to be able to uplift your team. So anyone who texts today, you get both of those coming your way as well. And that leads me to say thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, Amanda and WSBC for hosting. It's, I love the partnership that we have and it's great to be working with you. Um, those additional questions that I know some of you had, similarly, text, just put in there, want to talk to you about whatever it is um, and we can easily organise that, get in touch with you over the, next, over the next week or so. So thank you all very much and thank you for staying on board when we're just a little bit over time as well. Great, thank you very much, Di, and uh, thanks again to World Class Teams for presenting um, today's webinar. Uh, there are just a few places left in that advanced diploma um, starting at the end of the month, so if you do want some more information on that, please let us know. Um, and please check out wsbc.org.au for more information on any upcoming webinars and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Di. Bye Thank bye. everyone. Stay safe and enjoy. Lead well out of the recession. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.